And I think there's a lot of things in the Christian life that the Lord says, come to me and force my hand. a unique uh, formula. We talked through it biblically last week, but we're going to move into this. So this spring, uh, we did a Rafa room for an individual. They shared how when they were 12 years old, uh, their mom came to them and said, um, your dad is being unfaithful. And I realized it because over the last several months, if not years, I've been waking up to a demon who's been um, tormenting me in the night. So um, she said uh, to her child, to the person that we did the reference for, you know, I, so I want you to know about what dad's doing. And I want you to know that, you know, I, don't, I need help with this or I'm struggling with this. Well, that that night, the demon appeared to him, uh, the person we did the rock room with, and then has, has been appearing ever since for 20, 21 or 22 years. So you have this really interesting generational, like literally handed it off one day. It's a pretty wild, uh, wild event. So um, there's just a lot of things happening in the, in the church that we're seeing that are modern-day examples of what the scriptures lay out about iniquity visiting sin and iniquity in the early early old testament like genesis are um pictured like a crouching beast right sin crouches or lies at the door is what god says to cain so it's like i'm waiting for you and you have this opportunity cain to say no to what your mom and dad did um, or you can continue to rebel. So Cain is taken advantage of by the enemy who crouches at the door because of his rebellion. So you have this kind of like this spirit, this um, this presence and this torment that comes on Cain because of his decision to not respond properly to the Lord with uh, with sacrifice. So just trying to add some different nuance or understanding of uh, what generational sin, generational iniquity is. Um, but our, our main framework this morning is from, uh, and for the series, has been from the book of Esther, which is a book that um, it kind of devolves and then, or, or descends and then it ascends. And it has these patterns. You can see the, the changing point in the book is when Mordecai is exalted and Haman has to lead him around. So that that's like the, the shift. You have a meal before that and you have a meal after that. Um, you have a curse before that. You have a blessing after that. You have a decree before that. You have a decree. Like you can kind of see the, the, uh, the, re, the repeat, the reverse. So it's like a winding up and then an unwinding in the book. And the, the book begins with this king um cursing a queen and uh and it ends with uh, mordecai blessing the people so it's just kind of an interesting reflection and that's a uh, the overall pattern of the book but in the book we also see in the life of mordecai this uh generational blessing and curse that goes side by side the generational curse is that saul mordecai's great great great, great grandfather did not deal with Agag and his descendants as he was commanded to do. And so now Haman exists and he exists with a, with a hatred for the Jewish people because his great, 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 great grandfather was hewn to pieces by the prophet Samuel. Um, so he's a sworn enemy of the people of God. Mordecai's generational blessing is that King David, who he's not related to, spared Jonathan's son Mephibosheth. And so Mephibosheth's children, descendants, led to Esther and to Mordecai. So 
the generational curse that comes from Saul's disobedience, the generational blessing that comes from David's uh, forgiveness and favor. And that's a that's a beautiful thing to uh, to learn from, and I think there'll be some very practical applications we can make. So, I feel impressed from the Lord to I have felt impressed from the Lord to make this into a formula, which seems uh, very big and seems kind of audacious to do that. Um, but the, there are some formulas that we have learned from in the in the church from Scripture. The Romans Road is a formula for evangelism. Um, you don't have to hear the Romans Road to get saved, but it's a formula for evangelism. Um, there are f- formulas developed for how to have a devotional life, or 40 days of fasting, or how to walk with God. You've got the Daniel plan, right? It's a a, a book that has become, um, you know, that's been taken. It become a formula taken from the book of Daniel. So, uh, as a church, maybe we can work through and develop this Mordecai method for dealing with generational sin. All right, so I have 10 steps. It wouldn't be a good formula, right? If you didn't have steps, I gave you a paper to follow along with, and if you need a pen, uh, there's hand outs on the back table and pens. Let's ask for Jesus' help here. Father, I ask you, Lord, for uh, your guidance. Um, help us to be faithful to the word. And I pray that you would give us insight and revelation that in this uh, very simple Sunday school hour with a few people gathered together, you would allow us to discover something and put something together that will lead to dozens and dozens of people being set free from uh, generational iniquities of the past. All of this, Lord, we affirm is found in the power of Christ's blood the demonstration of his resurrection. So we ask, Lord, that you would bless this time. In Jesus' name, amen. So the Mordecai method. Mordecai means follower of Marduk. Marduk was a a god in Babylon, and Mordecai is essentially a slave to Babylon. So there's this one Mordecai um, that appears. It says in Esther 2 that he came over with um, Nebuchadnezzar. That's 100 years before. And it says in Ezra 2 that he is in Jerusalem with um, Nehemiah and Ezra rebuilding the walls. So uh, just to help you with the math, that's like 120 years. So either he lived a long time or people are naming, uh, or you have three Mordecais. And um, the vast opinion, the opinion from everybody I read was it's two of those three. <laughs> either it's the same Mordecai it, it, the Esther and Ezra and Nehemiah, but not the one who came over. But it seems like, um, potentially, it's the same Mordecai, and he lived a really long time, which is not unheard of in, uh, in that era. Uh, but you have this witness to the destruction of Jerusalem, and then potentially a um, forefather of the rebuilding of Jerusalem. And he gets the right to do that because of what happens in the book of Esther. So he is a son of the captivity, He's a recipient of the curse. Babylon, Babylon's invasion is uh, a curse, right? Nebuchadnezzar comes in. He takes the king. He kills all the king's sons in front of him. It's the last thing the king will ever see. And he plucks the king's eyes out. He chains the king to a horse or a camel, and he drags him 400 miles to, to Babylon. That's how uh, uh, Mordecai, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, that's what they witnessed as uh, they were being, as they're being dragged out, they watched Jerusalem in ruins. The temple's been destroyed. This is it. Nebuchadnezzar just destroyed and crushed the city. It's what grieved Daniel to pray. Do you still have a plan for our people, for your people or not? Or, is, or have you canceled that plan? Uh, Mordecai is a witness to that. Now Mordecai is in Persia. He seems to have developed or, or acclimated to the Persian culture. He makes these kind of political um, compromises uh, marrying a Gentile is against the law, but he's going to encourage Hadassah to marry Esther to marry a Gentile. Um, there's uh, eating of unclean food. There's you know the the sexual immorality that comes with um, the beauty pageant and the uh, essentially the the world's first bachelor reality show is the king tries out all these women to see which one he likes. So it's perverse. And nothing new under the sun. We all thought Esther was a new idea. Uh, turns out Esther did it. Um, and in all of this, you have this unlikely savior. But Mordecai is kind of a picture of this guy living in the world, struggling with his identity. 
and now he finds his people under a curse. So from his life that I taught last week, uh, we have these kind of 10 steps that as Mordecai dealt with the curse that came with Haman's decree to, to destroy the Jews, and to plunder, take all their stuff, um, these, these 10 things that, that happened in Mordecai's life. First, you have to come into agreement with Jesus. You have to come into, agree, uh, into covenant or agreement with Jesus. If you're not in covenant with the king, you have no authority to move forward. So for Mordecai, he establishes, he has a covenant with, with Esther, and Esther will marry the king, and so there's a covenant. So there's our biblical grounds from the story. There's a marriage covenant that takes place. We have to be in covenant. So this doesn't work with someone who's lost, right, essentially. Right? Don't cast demons out of lost people unless they want to get saved. And don't, uh, don't try to cancel generational sin or curses that are on lost people because they're not in covenant with the king. They're still under the curse of this kingdom. And the prince of power of the air is Satan. He rules over this kingdom. He has dominion. He has the authority, Luke 4, right, to give uh, a power away to, uh, that's in this kingdom. He told Jesus that. So um, you have to be in covenant. That's the easy one, right? Be sure they're saved. That's what it means. Two. Acknowledge the pain. That is, identify the situation that is out of alignment with God's word. In Deuteronomy, I'm going to try to just remember because I looked up yesterday. I didn't write it down. I won't remember what it is. But in Deuteronomy, there's a promise of blessing and curse that's laid out to the nation of Israel. And the blessing says that I will let it rain at the appointed times and let you bear a great harvest. But if you don't follow me, then you'll experience a drought and a famine. So you have this Old Testament um, conditional promise. The conditions are, follow me, be blessed, you'll harvest to be on time, you'll get the rain you need. And if you don't follow the condition, then it's a conditional curse. Um, it's laid out. So the illustration here is that when King David is king, he sees they're in a famine, and I know I'm switching stories here. He sees they're in a famine, and he realizes that they're under a curse, but he doesn't know why they're under a curse. But the scriptures tell him what good is and what bad is. So he can see from the scriptures that he's not under the blessing, but he's under the curse. So this is a time for us to acknowledge that we are experiencing something that the Bible says we shouldn't experience. Okay, so um, I give you life and life more abundant. The thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. So if something in my life is being stolen, is slowly dying, or is being slowly destroyed, then it seems like the thief is at work, right, according to the word of God. And so I'm not experiencing the blessing that I should. This is not to speak of being rich. This is not to deny the reality that it's a point a man wants to die and after this is judgment. Um, but it's to point out that there are things that are happening that seem to be contrary to what Jesus would want for us. So we have to acknowledge the pain and identify that this is out of alignment with God's word. When we're doing this, we should look for areas that cause fear, confusion, and threaten danger, as well as areas that defy the direct blessing of God. So if there's an area that's continually in confusion, God's not the author of confusion. The enemy has taken some territory in our lives, and we want to be able to acknowledge that that has happened and begin to see that this is out of alignment. This is not the way it's supposed to be. When we talked before the lesson started, several of you shared things in your family that are um, being repeated generation to generation, Right? Depression was, met, was mentioned. Church hurt was mentioned. Generation to generation being repeated, but we are realizing that's not the way it should be. So if it's not the way that it should be, right, then, we, then we know what we're going after. So for David, it was a famine. For Mordecai, it was, well, the Messiah hasn't come, and you're going to destroy us all. Right? Like, like it's, it's a very simple um, genocide for the Jews. is not the way it should be. Number three, discover the cause. So this is a time of fasting and prayer. For Mordecai, he throws himself down and he fasts and prays over the situation. He is mourning and accounting for the effects that this pain has had on the loved one. So he's grieving the fact that they're under this curse. We said last week, fasting and prayer draws the attention of the king, draws the attention of leadership. So Esther sends word to Mordecai and says, why are you grieving? 
you know, why do you have the sackcloth and ashes on it, essentially? So we seek to discover this co the cause. Um, and this is one where you're kind of waiting on the Lord, and you're listening, you're partnering with, you know, your spouse. If you're in, you know, covenant marriage, you're um, relying on your relationships in the body of Christ. Just say, would you pray with me about this? Th this is happening, and I want to know the cause. Uh, Pastor Jerry last week shared with us the illustration of this generational pattern he saw in um, a family of, you know, disrespecting um, mom, a severe rejection of, of the matriarch of the family, each generation. So he kind of pointed this out as something that um, was, that, that they had to see in, uh, in one relationship and then begin to identify going back this pattern. And then um, they went back to the earliest they could find where it had happened, and they looked for the initial cause of it. So David discovers the famine, and he asks, he inquires of the Lord through the prophets, and the, and the Lord responds and says, this is because of Saul's sin of killing the Gibeonites uh, that Joshua had promised to spare. So David, in his, in, in, uh, in his quest, he discovers the cause of it through fasting, prayer, listening to men, of, or, you know, seeking wisdom from men of God, uh, searching the scriptures. So we're looking for revelation from the Lord for why this has been allowed to happen. Okay, questions so far? Simple enough? Okay. Step four. Meal number one. This is the promise, right? Meal number one is all about the promise. I have to prepare a feast. This is a feast on God's word, though communion should be involved. During this time, we are consuming what is the bread, right? The word of God. And we're inviting the Lord to join us. We're looking for a clear manifestation of his presence. We may invite a person, if it's a person in our family that's afflicted, that we're, that, that, that we're looking for the cause of their pain. We might invite them to join us in this. A child, for example, that's on, we feel is under a generational curse. We might invite a spiritually mature friend, such as a pastor, prophet, intercessor, or teacher from, from the church. We see a collaboration between Esther and Mordecai and several others in the story, so there's this collaboration that needs to uh, take place. So... Um, in Esther, she has this first meal where she sits with the king. She has this meal in the presence of her enemy, right? That phrase from Psalm 23, you prepare a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. She has this meal in the presence of her enemy. And in this meal time, both during it and after it, she discovers a few things. First, she discovers that the king is generous. He promises her half the kingdom. I'll do anything for you. So for us, this meal of consuming God's words really want to identify God's heart for this situation. Um, right, it was a huge revelation for us to realize that God's heart was, was for healing and not continued sickness, right? That seems like a real simple thing now. Like We're all like, of course, but it wasn't, it wasn't how we felt. Many of us felt four or five years ago. So when we are trying to identify why this is happening and we want to find victory in it, the first thing we need to do is build our faith by seeing what God wants for the situation. Is this God's will? Is it God's will that this be happening? We may find that this is something God wants to happen or, or God's going to allow to happen. But in, in most cases, if you're this far into it and you're partnering with people in the church, uh, in the body of Christ or in your family and saying, hey, let's go after this situation, then you're going to search the word of God and you're going to find that God's heart is for this matter to be resolved, that uh, Jesus death on the cross has canceled the authority that this curse has, and it can be overcome. So we seek out in the Word of God all the promises of God towards His people, particularly in regard to the issue that we're dealing with. We discuss during this time the generous heart of God. So literally sitting over a table, eating communion, discussing with your family, with a trusted Christian brother or sister, the heart of God for this matter, his generous heart, the heart of the Father. We discuss the authority of God. Do we believe that he has the right to help us overcome our struggle? We discuss the power of God. Do we believe he has the strength to help us defeat our problem? We discuss the mind of God. Do we believe he has the wisdom to help us defeat our enemy? And then we engage in a time of communion. 
So two meals. That's meal number one. It's all about understanding the promise of God. Questions so far? Okay. Meal number two is the power. So we then establish a second time to gather and have communion in the presence of Jesus. Whereas the first one is all about the promise, understanding what God has promised in the situation. The second one is uh, the power. There's not a lot of times in the Christian life where we, we kind of put ourselves in a decision point. I think that was a unique thing. It is a unique thing about ministries like Holy Spirit Encounters. It brings you to a, a decision point. And after you get saved, right, especially you got saved when you were young, it was, it was like a real natural thing to walk into the Christian life, become a follower of Jesus because your parents were. You're not really put to the test to make a decision. Those who got saved a little older, they usually have a little firmer faith, and they're a little more okay with confrontation and decision. But a lot of Christians who get saved young, they're in a fixed state where they, they don't grow. Uh, or they're not prone to grow because um, they just kind of acclimate and and receive or accept whatever they got as a child. And so when they're confronted with a decision point, it feels very foreign because they've never had that. When you're 25, 30 years old and you're confronted with a decision point to follow Jesus, it's, not, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a much more difficult and polarizing decision than it is when you're five. So me being saved at five and then being confronted with, do you believe there's a baptism in the Spirit? And do you know what it's going to cost you? It was essentially going through the same experience as somebody who's, who's lost and is stepping out of a different religious tradition and leaving family would go through. Like, it's a real decision point. And I, I think there's a lot of things in the Christian life that the Lord says, come to me and force my hand. Right? If you, do you believe I'll save you or not? Do you believe I'll give you more of the Holy Spirit or not? Pursue me. Right? This formula might take more than 48 hours. This formula might take a year. But there's some critical steps from the book of Esther, I think, that we can implement one after the other to kind of pursue breakthrough in certain matters and put God to the test where he responds. He may respond like he did to uh, the Apostle Paul and say, I gave you this messenger to keep you humble. He might, but we shouldn't assume that's his response. We should make him respond, right? Make him respond seems uh, poorly worded, but we should, we should pursue him until he responds. So at Millennium, is all about the power. Remind the Lord of his blessings and promises that he's made to you. Openly and plainly declare who your enemy is and what strategies he's using to torment you. So in meal number two with Esther, um, she exposes who Haman is. He's an enemy of the people of the Jews. And that means he is my enemy because I am a Jew. So she declares her true identity. So this, this second, the power of God, right? When we walk in the power of God, it's because we understand our identity as children of God. If I have my mindset in the fallen brokenness of this world, I cannot be light and salt to the world. And I can't be light and salt to my problems. So there has to be a mental shift, a spiritual shift, a heart shift, all those things for me to move from this is how it's always been to this is not, this is going to stop right now. It's not going to be this way anymore. So Mill and about the power. Openly, plainly declare your identity as a child of God. Give your testimony, break the bread, and pour the wine. So they have this communion moment. This is the moment where the king um, openly tramples on Haman, so to speak. Just as King Jesus has made a show of his enemies, spoiling principalities and powers, Colossians says, um, the enemy is, uh, is taken and defeated and removed. Um, and Haman is impaled. Uh, you've got some translations. It's a giant sharpened stake, 75 feet tall. Others, it's a giant gallows. It looks like it's a, a, a giant stake. Like it's early crucifixion. It was the Persians. They didn't nail you to a cross. They just sharpened a pole and put it through your abdomen, left you on there. Um, and that's what, that's what the Romans turned into crucifixion. So it's, a, it's actually a crucifixion picture, which is pretty wild. Um, and so this, this time of communion is acknowledging that Jesus has won the victory and that he is king and that he has spoiled those principalities. And we are openly declaring that we believe in his power to deliver and to heal. 
We can say that a lot, but there's a, a building up here. There's a process here that brings us to a point of declaration and decision. Step six. Then we use our authority and the word of God to establish new decrees. So in the book of Esther, they take the law that the king has sealed that Haman led him to write, and they write a new law that gives them power over the old law. It does not cancel the old law, but it takes all the power away from it. So this process will not cancel the law that generational iniquity is visited in the fourth and fifth generation, or third and fourth generation. But this new decree, which is rooted in God's word, uh, takes away the um, power or the bite of that, of that first law. The, so the, the new covenant, right, fulfills the old covenant. So we write out decrees that allow us to overcome the unholy covenants that the enemy is enforcing in our lives. And we base these, these decrees in Scripture. So kind of in my mind, as I'm, and I told you we're in beta mode on this, in my mind as I'm looking at this, I'm thinking of a collaboration between family and church family. You're talking about a certain situation that you really think the Lord wants you to go after and defeat. And you're walking through this process and um, building towards this time of, of, of decree. If we're going to we're going to live this way. We're going to uh, believe God for this and seek God's heart on this. There's a, a lengthy process. Uh, if you remember in the story of Esther, Haman casts lots or essentially throws dice to determine what dates that he's going to um, carry out his extermination or genocidal acts against the, against the Jews. And, uh, and so he kind of he sets these dates, but it was a, a lengthy period of time, right? There's 10 months of time that passes. So again, um, it's just about uh, 48 hours for Esther. Uh, there's, I, I should say a little more than that. There's three days of fasting and prayer that uh, Esther asks of Mordecai and everyone. Then she goes into the king, and then 24 hours later, Haman is dead. But there's still a process that comes, that takes place after this decree, where they develop this understanding of what God wants us to decree. What does God want us to do in warfare to uh, overcome what the enemy is doing in our lives? I think this is a, a very underdeveloped part of the Christian life. I think probably charismaniacs take decrees and run with them. Uh, there's uh, some teaching that's rooted in Job. You know, I'll decree a thing and it will come to pass that seems to be taken out of context. That's not what we're looking for here. But we're looking for um, the Lord to give us a word from his word and in partnership with the gift of prophecy to help us understand how he wants us to attack this generational uh, curse or sin that's come against us. We base these decrees in Scripture, and, uh, and they become um, our lifeline and become our law that we'll abide by that will help us overcome what the enemy has done. Step seven. Identify the offspring of the tormentors and remove them. Identify the offspring of the tormentors and remove them. So Haman's whole family is destroyed in the book of Esther. The offspring of the tormentors for us is obviously not people, but rather it is uh, behaviors, possessions, and belief systems that are prevalent in your life that need to be eradicated. So if uh, sexual immorality is a generational sin, then um, as the Lord gives us victory over it, then it's looking at the behaviors and, and lifestyle patterns that need to be removed. Um, because I was bound by that sin, there were these behaviors and habits I had that need to go and, and need to be taken out. So um, as we're, we're looking at the lies we believe, right, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing to captivity every thought according to the obedience of Christ, 2 Corinthians 10. The Lord is uh, wanting us then to remove everything we allowed in. So we're making these decrees, and then we're looking at our life and saying, now, if I live this way, I'm canceling out the decree that I just made for healing. So I'm going to take it out. I'm not going to put up with that way of thinking anymore. I'm going to change the way I think. I'm going to change the way I spend my time. I'm going to change the way or, or, or get rid of this identity that I've carried. 
as we've talked about uh, with people who struggle with ongoing illness, there's an identity they ta- take on where they identify with the ongoing illness. And then they pray for healing, and then they leave, and they identify with the ongoing illness. And they keep walking in agreement with it. This is who I am. It's the part of, of, uh, of my identity. And it, it's a conflict with the healing. So the decree for healing comes. The desire for healing comes. We're asking the Lord to do something, but then we still have this identifying with it that has to, has to shift. That's a, a tormentor that needs to go. Step eight. So after, um, after Haman's family is gotten rid of, after this, uh, all those who celebrated the uh, attack against the Jews, after they are fought against and destroyed, then there's joy, the Bible says, in the city of Susa. It's filled with joy and celebration. And there's this anticipation of the day that's going to come. And so we worship in anticipation. We are worshiping the Lord and uh, um, enjoying his presence and lifting up his name. There's an overflow in our heart because we've been on this journey of transitioning from being in defeat and living in pain to seeking more from the Lord and embracing his blessing and his favor. So we worship in anticipation. And then next we develop traditions of celebration. So the, the feast of, or the holiday of Purim, is basically the holiday of Lot's. It's a Jewish version of Halloween. The Jews pass out little cookies. They call them Haman's ears. It seems kind of rough. Uh, the kids wear masks. They go door to door. They ask for blessings. The story of Esther is read out loud. Every time Haman's name is read, people boo and hiss and curse. And every time Mordecai's name is read, people cheer and shout. So like there's this tradition in the Jewish family of rejoicing over what God did. Very, very, um, you know, like, you know, I guess flamboyantly or, or very dramatically, right? I mean, many times you hear a story read out loud, boo, right? But there's this, there's this whole like tradition they have where they say, God set us free. This is how he did it. And that's the enemy. And this is the good guy. And we, we, we've shifted that way a little bit, our language. Like we, when people will word curse themselves, we'll stop, like you shouldn't say that. We'll say stop, I renounce the lie, repeat after me. Right? We have these little word shifts that we're trying to change the way we think, but there's still so much defeat and curse that a lot of Christians carry. It's a part of our identity. It's just the way it is. I prayed about it, it didn't change. Well, maybe our prayer needs process, and we need to take the weapons of warfare that Scripture's promises and, and build a process. And that's the idea behind this, and saying, okay, you know what? I'm tired of... The, the defeat that I keep feeling, it's a place of, of drain. My faith is drained. My confidence in the Lord is drained. This has to shift. So I'm going to partner with some people in my life who are spiritually healthy. We're going to identify the problem, and we're going to break it. And we're going to walk through a process uh, that, that changes. And then after it changes, we're going to celebrate the change. We're going to anticipate the healing. We're going to anticipate the freedom, the deliverance. And we're going to worship in anticipation. And then when God does it, we're going to celebrate it with a tradition. We're going to regularly, routinely in our life, maybe it's once a year, but we're going to, we're going to build in a time where we say, I was lost, but now I'm found. We can do that with spiritual birthday of getting saved if you want. But um, uh, for those who are saved young and we're saved from a life of innocence into a life of salvation, there's not a ton of celebration. But when you have breakthrough and you celebrate that breakthrough, what it does is it instills in the generation, next generation who celebrates with you that things are going to be different moving forward. And the Lord tells us, remember, 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 hundreds of times in the Psalms, forget not the works of the Lord. Remember uh, um, uh, the, the victories, remember the miracles, remember the marvelous deeds, the wondrous works that uh, I have done. Uh, forget not and remember, forget not and remember. One of the best ways to forget not and remember is celebrate. Uh, kids don't forget Christmas, right? So, and, and frankly, kids don't forget Halloween either. And, uh, and there's kind of, there's a shift in mindset that I have towards Halloween as I've been on this journey. Uh, cast out too many devils who came in during Halloween. But um, they're, they're, this process of the Feast of Purim is something where it's like, well, they're, they're not going to forget that. There's this whole dramatic thing they go through to not forget. And we've done this. We've had worship nights that we won't forget, Right? Uh, things that are just outside your comfort zone, that are visual, that experiential, and everyone says, wow, that, 
Uh, you shouldn't do that in church. Yeah, we should all just sit in seats, fold our arms, and be bored. But no, we do visually emotional um, and, and memorable things that touch your senses so that you won't forget. And we need to build those and instill those in our lives. So develop traditions of celebration. If you lose the heart of why you're celebrating, it becomes legalism, <laughs> right? So that, that's, that's something to keep in mind. And then we establish generational blessings. So Mordecai, if you're following along with me in the story, Mordecai goes from this man who is despised by the second most powerful man in Persia, which is Haman. He was the second most powerful man in the world. He's despised by him, and the first chance Haman gets, he's going to kill him. His death sentence is certain. His, his way of death is certain. He could point to a, a spot and say, right there is where I'm supposed to die. There's even a pole that's ready for me. My body is supposed to go there according to the, the decree of the second most powerful man in the world. But uh, I know someone who's greater. Because the covenant I have, even though my death looks certain, right? My sentence to death from the doctor looks certain, right? Cancer, or disease, this looks certain. I have been told by an expert in their field that this is how I'm going to die. I've been told by an expert in their field, or I've discovered in my life, a reality. This is a reality. I can't deny it. There's a giant 75-foot pole right there. I can't deny it. I've been sentenced to death. <laughs> or, or I can't deny that this, my child is wayward. Uh, I've seen their social media posts. I've seen the change in them. I can't deny that what's happening is happening. I can't deny the strife, or I can't deny this, this pattern of failure, generation to generation. I mean, we're not living in denial. Um, this is what's happening. And Lord, this is not what's supposed to happen. And I've prayed night after night after night about it, but I'm going to take a formula from your word, and I'm going to fix it. I'm going to go after it, and, and we're going to shift what's happened. And so I'm going to do what it takes to get your attention, Lord. And I know, I know you're already looking, but I don't sense your attention, so I've got to do something that connects me with your favor, with your attention. And Mordecai does that, and everything shifts. He doesn't die on that pole. The enemy is destroyed. And everything shifts for him. And he goes to being the second most powerful man. He goes to having all the authority in the kingdom that Haman had. And for us, and, and, and in you know, 30 minutes, we'll talk about authority. For us, that's the shift where we have, to, we have to understand that the shift has to take place in our mindset and our behaviors. We are not under the authority of Satan. We are not under the authority of this world. We render under Caesar that which is Caesar's, but we know that Caesar is just someone who is placed there by God. The king's heart is in the hand of the Lord. He moves it with us wherever he will. That's Caesar. That's different. We are going to shift from a mindset of being under the prince of power of the year to being mindset of being a royal priesthood, a chosen generation, sons and daughters of the king, and we're going to live in authority, and we're going to speak with authority. We're not just willy-nilly making authoritative statements, hoping they, they, we're not throwing authority out and seeing what sticks on the wall. We have a process of seeking the heart of the Lord on a matter, him giving us revelation of what we should do, running it by brothers and sisters in Christ who can help us be accountable, so there's a partnership, and then in the covenant of community, with the certainty of what the Lord's done in our life and how he's spoken, we're going to go after what the enemy has done. And so they had a plan in the book of Esther. It required faith. It had an element of risk. Um, and yet the Lord honored their stepping out in faith. And all of that shifts to then establishing generational blessing. Mordecai then goes back to Jerusalem. This man who was going to die on this pole in a foreign land actually gets to be a part of rebuilding the city where Jesus is going to come and walk in, where the rocks would cry out if the people didn't cry out, Hosanna. Those, those paved streets and the walls that Jesus walked next to and the, the temple that Jesus went in and ransacked, called it a den of thieves, all the ministry of Jesus happens in the place that Mordecai helped rebuild. So he, he establishes a generational blessing. And I think if the Lord tarries his return, um, there needs to be followers of Christ, believers, who are patriarchal in their approach to faith. And they say, somehow, in my lifetime, um, with the Lord's uh, allowance, uh, we're going to break this cycle. And 10 generations from now, people will be celebrating when everything changed. 
and they'll be celebrating in a stronghold of the Lord. So I read this morning in uh, Psalm 94. The Lord has become my stronghold and my God, the rock of my refuge. And so we have this fortress of security and safety where the stronghold of the enemy is torn down. And we could point back to a time when the Lord did it. We've been celebrating it for generations, what the Lord did. And in celebrating what the Lord did, we have developed a new stronghold, a new fortress. And it's the Lord. It's our faith. It's a, it's a, a generational blessing passed down to a thousand generations, right? So a process that breaks the stronghold of sin and builds a generational stronghold of blessing and faith. Um, it's forward thinking. It's different. As I said, taking this and just saying, hey, let's, let's follow these instructions feels audacious. But I think it's something the Lord wants to do is take him at his word and, uh, and begin to fight the enemy with the weapons that he's given us. Um, there's, a, there's a point in the story that's very unique, and I'll close with this. And I'll take some questions if you have. Esther has exposed Haman for who he is. Haman's been sentenced to death. And Esther throws herself down and she prays, essentially. She's on her face, weeping and pleading with the king to change the law, and he doesn't change it. And I think that's where a lot of Christians are at. A lot of Christians are praying and not, it doesn't change. And so they deconstruct their faith and they say there is no God because I prayed and he didn't answer. If you don't believe me, I can show you my Facebook feed. It's just, it, there's so many followers of Jesus who don't follow Jesus anymore because they prayed and nothing happened. And the reason that nothing's happening, a reason, I won't say it's the only reason in every situation, that would be ridiculous, but a prevalent reason that that happens is because they are trying to get God to cancel his laws instead of walking in the power of the new kingdom and um, allowing that new kingdom to create new laws that supersede this. So you have the laws of Haman and you have the laws of Mordecai. And this journey, this process is canceling the laws of Haman and writing new laws as Mordecai's. And most Christians never get there. They live under the laws of Haman and they plead with God to change them. And God says, get up and write new laws. Get up, take your New Testament, right? Take the word and write new laws. And if you don't, you're going to continue to live under them, and you're going to eventually say there is no God because he didn't change it. It's like, it's like jumping off a, a balcony and falling and then saying, Lord, why didn't, you, why didn't you fix it? Why couldn't I fly? Praying to, for the ability to fly and then going back up and jumping again and hitting the ground again. Well, God didn't answer my prayer. You say that sounds like a ridiculous illustration. Well, I taught at a college one time where uh, there was a kid who stood on a balcony and he said, I've been praying and I believe I can fly. And he jumped and he broke his legs. And, uh, and you say, that's ridiculous. Why would a guy believe that? Well, that's a, that's a really foolish picture, but a real story of what a lot of people do in prayer. Like, I, be, I prayed and I believe God's going to cancel his law. God doesn't cancel his laws. He's not canceling gravity unless there's another law. Right? So Jesus came and Jesus said, I won't cancel gravity. But I have another law. <laughs> And in the, in the new law that he had, he walked on water. Wait, he did cancel gravity. Well, he did something. He had a new understanding from his father, a new understanding of his identity that allowed him to change. We're not, we don't need to walk on water. We actually, but we need uh, to overcome certain generational curses and patterns in our world that need, that, that need to be um, defeated with the law, the dominion of our heavenly father. So I hope that was thought-provoking.